we're ready to roll. I hope everyone slept well. Anyone camped last night? Well done. Probably slightly fuzzy head if you head, headed into the old uh, worm bar or whatever it's called. Um, amazing setup. My name's Tim Field. I am part of the agri agriculture team um, here on behalf of the Dalesford Foundation. Um, agriculture is all about bringing practical research, on-farm research to farmers and then farmers engaging with other farmers in that knowledge exchange um, and building a community around practical sustainable farming. And uh, to start us off in the agriculture discussion tent this morning, we have Simon. Simon's going to talk about soil biota and, uh, uh, and your extraordinary knowledge on soil, which is going to be very enlightening. Um, I'm not going to take up any more time. Over to Simon, and then we'll catch questions and more discussion at the end of your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, so yeah, as I was just introduced, my name's Simon Jeffrey. I'm a lecturer at Harper Adams University. Uh, I'm going to start my presentation with a couple of caveats. Uh, the first one is I was asked to come here and do a presentation before being told that I was in the discussion tent. Uh, so you're going to get a presentation, but feel free to ask any questions at any point, just put your hand up or interrupt, that's of course totally fine. Uh, the second caveat is I was here presenting last year. Uh, I see a couple of faces in the audience again who've come back, for, uh, who were in my presentation last year, so thanks a lot for that. Obviously I couldn't assume that everyone had been in my, my presentation before, so I've got to run through a couple of slides at the start which I used in the presentation from last year. So if you happen to have seen some of those slides before, just look at it on a, a, as a bit of revision, which you might find useful for the exam we're going to have at the end. <laughs> okay, so on with the presentation, right if my slide, uh, here we go. So I'm going to talk today about uh, why we want to do no-till, why there is a movement towards no-till, and I'm going to do it very much from the perspective of soil biology. So I'm going to introduce some of the organisms in the soil, and then look at some of the research showing the impacts of tillage, the impacts of conventional agriculture, and some of the changes and improvements that having no-till systems has for those systems. So when we deal with soil, as humans, we normally look at soil in this sort of context. We walk around on a two-dimensional plane of soil. Soil appears to be very much this two-dimensional flat system. Even when we have some relief, when we see some hills, obviously the hills are going up and down, but we still interact with the soil very much as a two-dimensional system. Now that belies the fact that obviously soil has depth, and uh, it pretty much goes without saying, if you're a farmer, you dig down into soil all of the time. Here we have a soil profile pit. This is something that if you're a soil scientist, you will spend some time working with. Uh, and you can see here, when you dig down into soil, we, we can start to see that there is some depth to the soil. We can see some stratification. We can see some horizons forming there. And where we see this difference with, with depth, that's actually reflected in the biology as well. So I'm going to be looking at some of the communities in the soil, some of the surface dwelling versus subsurface dwelling communities. I'm going to be mainly focusing on the meso and macrobiota, that is insects and organisms that we can see with our eyes. The reason I'm not going to be looking at community level for the microbiology is if I do, I have to start using terminology such as phospholipid fatty acids and community level phenotypes, and I think it's a bit early in the morning for that sort of language. So, as soil scientists, we work with soils looking like this, and again, while we see there's depth, we're still interacting with them on a very much a two-dimensional plane. It's this flat surface that we see as the soil profile. And that belies a lot of the complexity that actually exists within soil. So if I can get this video to work, what we have here, this is going to look like a computer game. It's going to look like computer graphics. That's because it is computer graphics. However, this is a scan of a real soil system. The way that this image has been done, or this video has been done, is a cubic millimeter of soil has been very carefully extracted and put in a, put in a machine called an X-ray tomograph. That machine takes X-ray slices through this soil and twists the soil around, takes another X-ray slice, uh, and then the computer very cleverly reconstructs that image to give us this video. So while it looks like computer graphics, this is a real system. If you could squeeze yourself down to about the size of an amoeba, this is how the soil looks to you if it works. Uh, here we go. So you can see, once you're down at the scale of a, an amoeba, or potentially a very small microarthropod, soil is actually this massive 3D labyrinth. It's an incredibly complex environment. Uh, some of these pore spaces would be full of air, some of them would be full of water, 
with X-ray tomographs, they can't actually pick up that density difference, which is why we don't see any, see any water here. And actually, there's a limit of resolution to this X-ray tomograph. So on these walls, they look rel relatively smooth. In reality, there would be pores within pores, and everything gets a bit fractal. And there's this very complicated 3D system down there. So if you drag a little bit of metal, or a big bit of metal, through the soil, this is the type of system that you're disrupting. And this is the system that life within the soil calls home, and basically you're breaking up that home. So, that's a bit about soil as a habitat. So let's have a look at some of the life that exists within soil. Now, life that exists within soil interacts with each other very much as life does when it's above the top of soil. Basically, things are moving around, trying to find things to eat, or trying to run away from things that are trying to eat them. So here we have a below-ground food web. The main difference between the soil and the above-ground food web is in the above-ground food web, all of the energy initially comes from sunlight. Sunlight shines down on green things, on plants. Animals go out and eat those plants, then predators go and eat those animals. Below ground, we actually have two pathways. We have this initial pathway as well, where you can see light shining down on green things. Uh, animals eat those green things, and then they're predated on by other animals. But below ground, we also have the organic matter food chain as well. So once uh, some of the materials has been passed through animals, it can come back out in the form of uh, fecal matter, and that can then be digested by the microbes, which find themselves within the soil as well. So, different animals, different organisms associate, can associate themselves with soils to different levels. They're normally grouped up into four different categories. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this. As I say, if you, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. But I'm also on the Harper stand, so if you want to discuss anything, you can come and find me up there later. So I'm just going to touch on some of these things very briefly. But so organisms that you find within soil include things such as temporary inactive geophiles. These are things such as moths, which they form an association with soil, but when they do, it's normally from the, so the form of a chrysalis or a cocoon that they form within the soil, and they don't really perform any functions within the soil, apart from sometimes being a prey item for other soil organisms. I'm going to skip over the middle two. They're basically just increasingly closely associated with soil. But some organisms, such as the earthworms, known as geobionts, they have a very strong relationship with soil, such that they really can't survive for long periods outside of the soil at all. So we have these range of organisms in the soil. The more we disturb the soil, the more we can move these organisms around and take them from the environment that they put themselves in in the soil and move them into an environment where they're not necessarily so happy. So some of these cocoons, for example, need to be fairly near the surface. If you run through and do some inversion ploughing, you bury them down much deeper in the soil, and that doesn't do them any favours. Same with earthworms. Some of them live in the deeper depths, as we will see in a minute. When you bring them up to the surface, they don't, they don't respond terribly well to that either. So, earthworms. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware, if you're interested in conservation agriculture, of the importance of earthworms. In the UK, we have 27 species of earthworms. Some are relatively easy to identify. Some of them are much more difficult. Now, I deal with functional ecology. I'm much more interested in the function of these organisms within the soil. So, thankfully, you can actually divide all, uh, earthworms up in functional groups, or ecotypes, as they're normally referred to. And that's much, much easier to do than identifying them to species level. Some of them, if you want to identify them to species level, you have to get a microscope out and look for the male pores and count how many segments along they are from the saddle, and it's not a lot of fun, really. But if you're just dealing with ecotypes, it's very easy to recognise the three different uh, versions that you get. The top ones, you can see over here, the epigeic. Uh, these are surface-dwelling or litter-dwelling earthworms. They live on the soil surface, and because they're exposed to the sunlight, they need to have some pigmentation. That pigmentation protects them from UV. It also makes them a little bit darker, so they blend in more readily with the soil surface and the litter, so they're not predated on as readily by birds. So it's quite easy to remember that the surface dwelling ones basically get a bit of a suntan. So if you get an earthworm in your hand and it's darker on one side than it is on the other, you know that's an epigeic. You don't need to get a microscope, you don't need to look for male pores or any of that. So much, much easier to work with. The next one that you can see in the list are endogenic earthworms. They live within the soil. They generally cast in behind themselves within the soil. They don't form casts on the surface as uh, the next group of earthworms that we're going to look at do. And these ones, because they spend all their time within the soil, they don't pick up this pigmentation. They don't pick up a suntan. So if you have an earthworm in your hand, and you turn it over, look at both sides, and it looks the same colour on both sides, you know you've got an endogenic earthworm. The third group, these anisics that we see at the bottom, these form these semi-permanent burrows that you can see down here. These are very, very important for uh, organic matter incorporation into the soil, for facilitating water infiltration into the soil. 
And again, these are relatively easy to recognize. The way that they feed, they normally come out at night, and they stick their head up out the top of the burrow and forage around looking for organic matter. They pull some of that organic matter down into the soil, and they form little middens around the hole. Because they stick their head out, they generally end up getting a suntan on their head, but their tails normally stay within the soil, so their tails remain unpigmented. And again, so if you look at the, an earthworm and you can see darker at one end, lighter than another, you know you've got an anisic earthworm. So some of these indices that people are starting to develop, where they say you need to know whether you've got 16 earthworms per spadeful and you need to identify whether you've got three ecotypes, is relatively easy to do without having to spend a, a few days at a workshop with experts identifying these things to species level. Now, earthworms are known to be very important because they perform various functions within the soil. The first one is that they mix the soil up, they help incorporate residues that are on the soil surface and drag them down into the soil. That's important because as they get dragged down, that material gets dragged down into the soil, it's then exposed to the microbes that exist within the soil who can then break down the organic matter, release the nutrients that would otherwise be locked up, and those nutrients are released close to where the plant roots already are so they can be readily uptaken by those roots. Another one that I mentioned just now is these anisic earthworms. They form these deep, uh, semi-permanent semi burrows. Uh, somebody has very patiently dug out one of these burrows here. Hopefully it's not too hard to imagine if you have a rainfall event. I don't know why this mouse pointer is not working very well. If you have a rainfall event, it's not too hard to imagine how readily water will come down through this crack compared to this relatively dense bulk soil on either side. So if you get more anisic earthworms within your soil, when you have rainfall events, that water will infiltrate instead of running over the surface of your soils, and that will help to reduce erosion. Now, soils are remarkably diverse ecosystems. There's a whole array of organisms. I don't have time to go into many of them. I'm going to spend more time talking about function today than I spent last year, and last year I only had time to cut, touch on these very briefly. Here we have a, a range of what are known as soil macrofauna. These are the larger organisms that you find within the soil. And these also find themselves in these kind of stratified layers. Some organisms are very well uh, adapted to live on the soil surface, such as this ground beetle that you can see, this bigger organism here. They are great things to have in uh, agroecosystems. They're predators that prey on soft, uh, small soft prey, such as aphids. So they're important predators but they have these long limbs and relatively delicate bodies. If you start burying them in the soil by turning over the soil with a plow, they don't respond very well to that. And if you're wiping out some of your uh, predators, then that means your, their prey population can start to increase. At the other end of the scale, we have fly larvae at the bottom. They actually cope much better being within the soil. They can't cope with drying out very well. They don't like desiccating. So, but they are very important in the soil in terms of the decomposition pathway, so they can accelerate the breakdown of organic matter and the liberation of nutrients. If you bring those up to the surface, well, they're not pigmented, so when they're exposed to the UV light, they don't like that very much. And they're white on a dark brown soil surface, and they're nice little balls of protein, so birds will find them very easily and remove them from your soil. So again, once you start interfering with this stratification that we get within these soil organism groups, it can have negative impacts on the diversity and the amount of biology that you have within your soils. So coming down in size, the, those groups that I just talked about are what's generally known as the macrofauna. I'm going to look at a couple of the mesofauna. These are slightly smaller organisms. I'm going to spend most of this uh, section focused on the calembola for a couple of reasons. One is, well, for a start, they look great. They're, they're quite pretty organisms. And the second is they're another organism that's being promoted increasingly as a metric for soil health. So here we have some surface uh, adapted calembola. The reason you can tell they're surface ad adapted is very much like with earthworms. They're pigmented. They have all of this very nice coloration. Some of that's to help with camouflage. Some of it's to help with uh, uh, protection from UV light. Uh, they, uh, calembola are commonly known as springtails because they have this appendage at the back, which is known as a furcula. That image that you can see at the top on the left is actually a dead calembola. That furcula would normally be bent round underneath their belly. And they run round on the soil surface. If a predator comes near to them, such as a pseudoscorpion that we saw in a previous slide, they flick that furcula, go flying up in the air, and hopefully escape from that predator. Now, Calembola communities also stratify as you go down into the soil. So those previous slides that I sh showed you, as well as having pigments, well, if I can go back, they all also have long appendages, they have long antennae, they have long arms, and they're quite bulbous in some cases, so they're not very well adapted to being able to push themselves through narrow pore spaces. 
But again, relatively easy to identify as to whether it's a surface dwelling columbola versus a subsurface dwelling columbola. That's because the subsurface dwelling columbola generally don't have pigmentation. They're protected from the sun, so they don't need any protection from UV. They are in a very dark environment, so bothering to spend energy on camouflage isn't going to help because things can't really see them anyway. And they're adapted to be able to push themselves through these small pores that you find them find within the soil, such as in the video that I showed you earlier. So they have very short appendages, they have very short antennae, and they don't actually have a, a furcular at the back. They don't have a springtail, because when you're under the ground, there's not much point in having a springtail. You're not going to escape from anything. The best thing, or the worst thing that's going to happen is you end up with a headache because you bang your head on the pore space above you. So once again, Kalimbala, there's about 600 species known worldwide. Uh, Identifying them down to species level is a very difficult thing to do. There's not too many people in the world that can do it. But to identify surface dwelling versus sub-surface dwelling organisms, hopefully you can see from these two slides, is relatively easy. And that's why they're being promoted as tools for looking at soil health. <coughs> now, there are other groups of soil mesofauna which can also be included. I'm just going to touch on some of these very briefly. We have uh, over here, this is an Anki trade, the common name of which is a potworm. We have a Diplurin up here, we have Bristletail, uh, and a uh, Proturin down here, the common name of which is a Conehead. This is the head end, I'll leave you to figure out why it's called a Conehead. And here we have some Akari, various mites. So again, these organisms are generally a similar sort of size to the Calembola, they can be a bit longer. Some of them are surface adapted, but the vast majority of them are subsurface adapted. So you, you can recognize them very easily because, they, again, they don't have pigments, they have short appendages, and they have short antennae. Now, one of the metrics that has been developed in order to try and use these characteristics to identify soil health is something that's known as the QBS index. QBS actually comes from the Italian, meaning quality biological of the soil, because in Italy they speak the wrong way around, but it's basically the soil biological quality index. And what you do is you just look at the, these organisms. If you get a surface dwelling organism, they score more low, they score fewer points than if you have subsurface dwelling organisms. The reasoning behind this is if you have a disturbed system, generally you'll get the surface dwelling organisms coming back in very readily. They're capable of migrating relatively quickly. Some of the springtails can jump in, they can get blown in. And so if you get a system which has lots of surface dwelling organisms, but very few subsurface dwelling organisms, that indicates what you're looking at is probably quite a disturbed system. What the cause of the disturbances may not necessarily be clear. If you're working in a conventional system, it's probably the fact it's been ploughed and power harrowed. And what you can do is by adding, looking down the microscope, looking at the surface dwelling characteristics versus subsurface characteristics, you can score all of these things together. And here was a paper that was published by Christina Mento et al. back in 2011. And what they showed is basically what you would expect. If you've got a sugar beet field, if you're growing root crops, that's generally a much more disturbed system. Through corn, uh, up to wheat is generally a little bit less disturbed. And over here we have permanent grassland and woodland, which score much higher. So this metric seems to fall in line with what you would intuitively expect in terms of which of these soils are likely to be healthier and which of these soils are likely to be more disturbed. So there's also a lot of potential there. This isn't a test which is currently commercially available, but it is being developed and is quite well developed within the research context at least. It may be rolled out in the future with uh, the commercial scale too. Okay, so that's the macro and mesobiota. I'm going to have a brief look at the microbiota. I'm going to avoid any of the terminology that I mentioned earlier, such as phenotypic community, uh, uh, sorry, community level phenotypes, and just look at the function of these organisms within the soil. So I'm sure you all know fungi, you know mushrooms as you're walking around, or toadstools, whatever you want to refer to them as. This is a relatively small part of the fungal biomass. The vast majority of the fungi that you see exist below soil as these hyphal networks. So here you can see these blue lines going through the pore space. These darker areas over here, this is uh, soil material. These areas around here are pore space. And this fungus has been stained so that you can pick out much more easily with this fluorescent microscopy. They don't normally glow blue as they're growing through the soil like that. Now, one of the more famous types of fungi is something that people are talking about quite a lot, and indeed around here you can find uh, people that are selling mycorrhizal inoculations. That's all to do with mycorrhizal fungi. So, what are mycorrhizal fungi? Well, they're a fungus which forms a very close relationship with plant roots. There's a few different types of them. Some actually penetrate into the roots, some form sheaths around the outside of the roots. And what they do within this relationship, generally, uh, fungi are 
they're limited by the amount of carbon they've got. They're generally interested in trying to get hold of more carbon so they can get more energy. But they're very good at scavenging through the soil. So for them, finding things such as water, phosphorus is not normally such a tricky thing. Plants, on the other hand, they're never really limited for carbon. They can photosynthesize, so they use sunlight and the carbon in the air to make more plant material. So they're not really fussed about running out of carbon. What plants are fussed about is getting hold of water and getting hold of phosphorus. And plant roots are generally quite thick. They're certainly much thicker than these filamentous fungal hyphae which grow through the soil. So for a plant root to push through the soil, especially if you get slightly compacted soil, it has to spend energy pushing those soil particles out of the way, and they don't generally spread through soils anywhere near as readily. So this relationship exists because the fungi go out and scavenge for water and for phosphorus, growing through the soil very readily, and they give that to the plant, and the plant says, oh, thank you very much, oh, that's very nice of you, have some carbon. So that's why this relationship has developed. It's such a prolific relationship that uh, more than 90% of terrestrial plants actually form this relationship, it's only really the brassicas that don't. Now these organisms uh, actually can form relationships with multiple different plants, and it's been shown that by sending compounds through these mycelial networks, through these fungal networks that exist below ground, plants can actually communicate with each other. It would be an exaggeration to say they talk, of course, but it's certainly not an exaggeration to say that they can communicate. And they can pass on information such as whether they are illuminated or whether they are in the shade. They can pass on information such as whether there are uh, herbivores coming in, and there's a list here showing all of the things which have been shown to be communicated below ground between different plants. And this is uh, from the primary research literature. This isn't pseudoscience. This is all fully referenced stuff, uh, things which have proven to have taken place through uh, empirical studies. This includes things such as the def defense response of a leaf-chewing caterpillar. So if you have a field of a crop and there are some caterpillars starting to infiltrate from one side, those plants which are being herbivorized, that are being chewed on by those caterpillars, will send out signals through the mycelial network, which other plants will then pick up on, and they will start upscaling their defenses. They will do things such as start emitting volatiles to try and attract in natural predators, for example. So this is one of the reasons why no-till from a fungal point of view is certainly a very good thing. If you can go out there and direct drill and get your seeds into the soil, your plant starts to grow and send out roots, well, there's already this fully functioning below-ground mycelial network that they can plug into. If you've got a field which has been uh, conventionally tilled, it's been inversion ploughed, it's been power harrowed, these fungal mycelium are relatively fragile. They get broken up through that process, and you'll need to wait for the mycelial networks to grow out again and re-establish themselves. It varies. It varies very much between soils. It can take seasons. It uh, can take just one season. It, it, really, it really varies. So, yeah, difficult question to answer, I'm afraid. Generally, there's quite a lot of background mycelium within the soil. So whether you actually need to go and inoculate, the jury is still very much out on that. But certainly, if plants can go in there and while the seedlings are establishing, if you get then some pests coming in from the side, they'll be able to communicate that much more readily. If you've got a, uh, a ploughed field, it's probably when they're much more established that they'll be able to undertake this sort of communication. Okay, final group of microbes then. Again, I'm going to avoid complex terminology, but if you have any questions or I say anything that's unclear, please feel free to shout out. So we're going to have a look at some of the bacteria that exist within soil now. Bacteria exist right at the limit of what microscopes are capable of resolving. So if I were to show you some microscope slides, you can't really see the full length of diversity that you see, which is why I'm just using this image here. You get these little balls, these cocci, these rod-shaped organisms, these spirochetes, really a wide range of different types of morphologies. Within the soil, these uh, bacteria generally grow on the walls of the pore space. So if you imagine, again, that three-dimensional video that I showed you earlier, if you're actually flying through there as an amoeba, you'll see various bits of bacteria growing in different places on those walls. All of these blue spots that you can see in there are bacterial cells which are taken up dye, which, again, are used for fluorescent microscopy. And what you can see here is there's a large pore space down here, a smaller pore space up here, with lots of soil material around uh, in the middle. Now, some bacteria, because soils are relatively dynamic environments, the aggregates are being broken down and reformed as they wet and dry and freeze and thaw. You can end up with bacteria which are stuck inside aggregates, such as this one here. These bacteria will be ticking along fairly slowly. They don't have a very ready food source available. They're reliant on the rate of diffusion to bring in their nutrients and the rate of diffusion to take their waste away. 
If you break open these aggregates, again, by dragging a bit of metal through, by power harrowing your soils, you liberate these bacteria and you can uh, greatly increase their activity. So it's not only bacteria that you can find protected inside aggregates. Quite often you'll find bits of organic material, soil organic matter, protected inside aggregates. Soil organic matter is quite sticky stuff on a molecular level, so it's quite actually quite good at binding soil aggregates together. So again, this is, if you'll excuse my fairly rubbish drawing, so the point that this is trying to make is here you have a load of bacteria on the outside of a soil aggregate, and running through there is a bit of perhaps an old plant root, which is completely protected from those bacteria. They'd love to get in there and decompose it so they can use it as an energy source, but they just can't get in there because it's completely surrounded by the mineral phase of the soil. Now, once more, if you drag a power harrow through uh, or any other large implementation through your soil, you can break open these aggregates and expose them for microbial decomposition. This can be quite good from a plant perspective initially because as these bacteria get in and break down the carbon that's available there, they release nutrients into the soil. So if you plough a field that's not been ploughed for a while, you can notice that the first crop that comes through can actually come through quite vigorously. That's generally because you're releasing a lot of these nutrients which were in these protected aggregates initially that weren't previously plant available, <laughs> that are made plant available through this process. However, what you can see also coming out is as well as the nutrients, we have CO2 coming out, carbon dioxide. That is the carbon, the soil organic matter from your field, leaving your field. And that's not necessarily a good thing. Soil organic matter is very good at holding on to moisture. So the more you have, the more drought resistant your fields are. It's uh, the food source for the biology. So if you lose lots of your carbon in a single flush because you're breaking up your soils uh, through conventional tillage, that can deplete your soil organic matter over time. And that can mean the biology doesn't have access to the food that it needs further down the line. So here's a conceptual image that was published some time ago, well, in 2016, by Arujo. And what this shows is, as a soil develops, generally, soils develop in a place where the inputs of carbon into a system are greater than the rates of decomposition. This can occur when you get uh, weathering of various rock environments. It can occur over relatively long periods if we're in the temperate environment, or relatively short periods if you're in the hot, humid tropics. So what this is showing is soil organic matter is increasing over time. And then if you decide, well, this field looks quite good for agriculture, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plough it. Well, as soon as you do that, you're going to break open those aggregates, start bringing bacteria into contact with the soil organic matter. They'll start mineralising that carbon, releasing some nutrients. If you've got plants that are growing, crops that are there ready to take it up, that can be quite a good thing. If you plough your soils and leave them fallow for a while, well, most of your nitrogen will just wash away and it's not going to do you any favours at all. But if you keep uh, ploughing and ploughing your field, you get to a stage where inputs can be lower than decomposition. And this is what leads to soil organic matter loss. This is one of the reasons why, if you look around the country, uh, soil organic matter levels are quite a lot lower than they were if you were to go back hundreds or thousands of years. Now, conservation tillage and conservation agriculture, the idea with this is to try and swap that system around. You don't want decomposition to be less... Uh, so you don't want your inputs to be less than decomposition, you want your inputs of carbon into the system to be greater than decomposition. And by doing that, you can start to build up your soil organic matter levels again and gain all of the benefits that that soil organic matter brings in terms of increasing the resilience of your soils, increasing your aggregate stability, preventing erosion, so on and so forth. So it's not just the soil organic matter that tillage interferes with within your soil as it's probably not too hard to imagine if you're a long, soft-bodied earthworm and somebody bits, drags a bit of metal through your home, or even worse, through your body, it doesn't really do you any favours. So it's been known for a while that conventional tillage is, generally has negative effects on earthworms, but within science, when you have a range of different studies, different people find different things and different levels of impacts. It's quite often hard to interpret these wide range of studies. So back in 2017, uh, uh, Maria Briones and Olaf Schmidt published what's known as a meta-analysis. Basically, they went out and looked for all of the studies where people have done an experiment looking at the impacts of tillage on earthworm abundance and biomass, uh, and drew all of those studies together into a single database, which takes quite a bit of work, is a bit of a pain in the neck to do. But once you've done it, you can then use some statistics that you guys don't really need to worry about. But again, feel free to come and find me if you have questions about it later. You can interrogate those databases using statistics to try and find out what's happening as a general rule of thumb across all of these studies. So that's the name of the paper. If any of you want to search for it, it is available open access, so you can have a look in, uh, to your heart's content. Published in Global Change Biology, which is quite a prestigious journal. 
Now, they, uh, you, in order to do, do their analysis, they had to categorise the studies in different ways. Now, I'm sure you're all aware, any of you that work with farming, if you talk about mintil, mintil doesn't necessarily mean exactly the same thing to every different farmer. Reduced tillage, again, doesn't necessarily mean exactly the same thing. So what they had to do was try to interpret all of these different categories and group them up in the best way that they could. So in order to understand the next slide I'm going to show you, you have to understand these categories. And the categorizations they used were no-tillage, which is fairly standard, conservation agriculture, which is basically no-till but with use of cover crops and with increased uh, organic matter incorporation into the soils, generally through farmyard manure or other types of residue applications. They then used uh, what they've defined as, defined as a shallow soil loosening, SSL, which is superficial tillage, non-inversion tillage, but dragging something through the soil to a depth of less than 15 centimetres. They contrasted that against deep soil loosening, which again is non-inversion tillage, but dragging something through that's deeper than 15 centimetres, up to about 25 centimetres. And then they had reduced tillage, which is shallow ploughing, inversion tillage, but only to doing inversion tillage of the top 15 centimetres of the soil. And in this next figure I I'm going to show you, they compared all of these to what they classified as conventional tillage, which was inversion ploughing to a depth of at least 25 centimetres. Now here's the figure that they produce. I'll talk you through how to interpret this. So this is something that's known as a forest plot. What you can see on here are these various points. These points show the average effect of these different treatments. At the bottom we have the percent change in earthworm abundance. For the statistically minded in the room, these bars show what are called the 95% confidence intervals. If you've never heard of that, you don't need to worry. You don't need to know that to interpret it. What you need to know is if these bars intersect the zero line, that means in scientific terms, we think there's no real effect there. We're not confident enough to say there's actually any difference at all. So what this shows is if you have a no-till system, you can expect somewhere around 150% increase in earthworm abundance compared to having a, a conventional till system where you're inversion ploughing the topsoil. Compare this to con conservation agriculture, and there's really no, not very much difference between uh, where you have no-till and where you have conservation agriculture. If you have shallow soil loosening, you can expect somewhere about a 50% increase in the abundance of your earthworms. But if you have deep soil loosening, you can see these, this bar intersects the zero line, possible that that's beneficial to your earthworms, but with this database we're not confident enough to say that's definitely causing a significant effect. And interestingly, if you have reduced tillage, reduced tillage, basically inversion tillage of the top part of your soil to 15 centimetres, has basically the same effect on your earthworm populations as doing conventional tillage. That is, it doesn't do your earthworms many favours at all, and you will ma massively reduce the population of earthworms you have in your soil through applying those pro approaches. So, what you can take away from this figure, oh, sorry, one final thing I forgot to mention, these numbers over on the side here, that's basically the, a number of studies that the statistic is based on. The bigger that number is, the more confident we have in that bit of data, that statistic, basically. So what this shows is, no-till and conservation agriculture are massively beneficial to your earthworm populations, if you compare that to any of the other types of tillage up there. Now, why would you care about earthworms within your soil? You've all heard, I'm sure, that they're beneficial for soils. I've pointed out earlier that they're good for organic matter incorporation and for water infiltration. But what does that actually mean in real terms? Does it actually provide us any crop benefits? Oh, no, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. There's one other figure that they pulled out first from the, this study before I get onto the earthworm meta-analysis. There's quite a lot of debate around glyphosate at the moment. I'm sure you're all aware if you're trying to move towards conservation agriculture, if you're trying to use uh, cover crops, can be very useful to spray them off with glyphosate before you direct drill in your next crop. So what are the impacts of glyphosate on earthworms? Well, what they found, uh, again, comparing no-till systems, here we have with glyphosate, here we have no glyphosate, and here we have pesticides, so they kind of grouped all other pesticides together. What they found is that basically glyphosate has no impact on your earthworm populations. If you were to have a no-till system using glyphosate, that's massively beneficial to your earthworm populations compared to doing conventional tillage and not using glyphosate. So now, getting back to where I was just... Yep, sorry? Just one question while you're on that subject. Pesticide, would you include um, fungicide? 
I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, I'm afraid. They are very general with what they included in their pesticides. So I couldn't tell you specifically off the top of my head from fungicides. I can't remember from reading the paper, I'm afraid. But, but the paper is open access. I'm very happy to show you the link later so you can have a look through. But the, would the general trend be pesticides per se are generally not that harmful to soil biota? Uh, pesticides are generally much more harmful to soil biota than herbicides. So that, that's where the distinction is. Pe here they're using pesticides, which are things which are aimed to specifically wipe out pest organisms. So they're more animal specific rather than glyphosate, which is plant specific. But whether they included fungicides in that pesticide, yeah, that's, that's what I can't remember, I'm afraid. Okay, so getting back to where I was just going, so why would you worry about earthworms in your soil? I mean, it's good if you can reduce the amount of soil erosion you're getting by infiltrating that water, but does it have any real effects on crop yield? Well, this is another meta-analysis that was published back in 2014, and what they found was if you have, in, across all of their studies, where they compared the impacts of growing with earthworms present to growing with no earthworms present, they produce what they refer to as the earthworm effect down the bottom, and what you can see up here, above ground biomass and crop yields, each of which suggests that if you have more earthworms present, you can expect something like a 25% yield increase compared to not having any earthworms present. This is true whether you look at above ground, whether you look at below ground biomass, so perhaps if you're more interested in root vegetables, uh, or total plant biomass. What they didn't see any difference was, it was in the uh, shoot to root ratios or the amount of nitrogen that's actually taken up by the plant. That's nitrogen concentration per gram of uh, plant tissue. So you get bigger plants, more nitrogen taken up overall, but not more nitrogen, so not, not no more protein in your wheat, for example, but bigger yields regardless. If you can get earthworms to work for you and produce 25% more yields from them doing the work rather than you, well, that's got to be a pretty much a no-brainer, I would suggest, as being a good thing. Okay, so now that's some general work that I've been talking about. Now I'm going to move on and have a look at a couple of no-till experiments that I've been involved in, uh, including with people in the audience from here. 